Welcome to Get Inspired with Jason, the podcast and YouTube show. And you know, I'm always talking about getting happy. You know, I was miserable for 20 plus years, obese, unhappy, and just miserable, but I made myself happy. So today we're going to talk about happiness again, but I have a special treat because it's not going to be tips by me. We're actually going to be talking about how to create your own happiness, having amazing relationships with yourself, others, friends, and partners, and most importantly, how to get rid of a negative mindset. Today, we have the one and only Rob Mack, psychology expert, celebrity happiness coach, author of Happiness from the Inside Out, and Love from the Inside. What's up, Rob? What's up, man? Wow, I love the intro. I'm going to come back here more often just to get that intro. Right. Just when you're having one of those crappy days, you're like, let me holler at Jason real quick. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's how it actually does work in real life between us. So, yeah. Hey, this is Jason Roselle and welcome to Get Inspired, the official podcast and YouTube show that will empower your mind, body, business, social media, branding, relationships, and anything that's holding you back from becoming the best version of you. Listen, Before I became a TV personality, an author, a celebrity trainer, a life and wellness coach, and the founder of Caliente Fitness, I was broke, obese for 20 plus years, full of stretch marks, full of excuses, and most importantly, here's the deal. I was unhappy. I was able to change my life completely, and since then, I've helped thousands do the same. This show is gonna bring you awesome guests, tons of helpful programs that'll aid you But most importantly, your questions and topics that will make this show your show. My question is this. Are you ready to get inspired? Well, get ready because the show starts now. So I'm really excited to tell the audience before we dive into questions. You know, Rob and I met on on a show several years ago and uh, he interviewed me with some amazing other co-hosts. And, you know, he's worked with some amazing people. One amazing person that really stands out, he's been actually endorsed by Oprah Winfrey. He also has been endorsed by Vanessa Williams, Lisa Nichols, many others. He's worked with a lot of A-list, B-list, and reality stars such as myself, Tiffany New York Pollard, Ronnie from the Jersey Shore. How was that? How how was all these experiences working with all these people? So amazing, man. You know, I didn't have... uh really any expectations going in for bad, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. And I was just really pleasantly surprised by all those experiences. The two years on Famously Single on E, just fantastic. You know, um, the production team and the network were just amazing. The reality stars were fantastic. You know, it's so interesting because the conversations often went a lot deeper than I think people were sort of expecting. Um, so that was always fun. It didn't always end up, you know, um, in the actual show. Sometimes it ended up on the cutting room floor, but that was fine. Um, and then the year I did um, on own on a show called Mind Your Business was fantastic. Um, and then Good Morning La La Land, which is where I met you. Uh, so yeah, I've been uh, extraordinarily fortunate and lucky and blessed to have the experiences that I've had. Heck yes, brother. So let's start off by really, this is one of my favorite questions. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Unconditional happiness. I know it just sounds so cliche, but I'd say, honestly, just to be, you know, sort of indifferent to the thoughts, uh, words, and behaviors of other people, and to be able to, at will, on demand, sort of tap into that unconditional happiness. Uh, so that's the answer I'd give you from you know my perspective. I'd also say um, it probably wouldn't um, be the worst thing if you could just create anything in the world that you wanted on demand, at will, whenever you wanted. Right. So that'd be pretty cool, too. Um, yeah, I'd say those are probably my two those are awesome answers, by the way. I guess my question for anyone that's watching or listening, when someone says, you know, superpower, because I agree. I mean, that legit is an amazing superpower, happiness. Now, a lot of people may be thinking, well, if I can create my own happiness, right, I, I guess I already have superpowers, right? Oh. So you correct me if I'm wrong. You already possess this, and you just you just rather stick to your superpower, correct? Dude, that's right. I, I love Jason. I love you so much, man. Because only you would see that and say that, and it's true. I mean, that's why I said it. Um, because it's because it's true for me, but also because everyone has that superpower, and they yeah. just maybe haven't tapped into it or tapped into it as consistently as they could. So yeah, that's exactly right. Love what you said. See, me and you are. I feel like we're playing tennis right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everyone 
possesses the superpower being happy, right? Yeah. Yeah. But isn't it crazy that most people sometimes don't know how to turn it on, right? Absolutely. I mean, and you know, we have similar stories. That was my story for the first 20 some years of my life, man. I was so deeply depressed and suicidal. And I honestly couldn't do or didn't think I could do anything about it. You know, I thought, oh, I'll make some money and that money will save me from this unhappiness and I'll do well athletically and that will save me from it. And then I'll do well academically and relationally and socially and financially, all the ways, right? All the ways you try all the things. And what's interesting is that the more successful I became in lots of ways, the less happy I became in almost every way. And it was extraordinarily disorienting and frustrating and it only deepened my depression. You know, and I got so depressed that I eventually got to a place where I was like researching ways to kill myself. Um, yeah, but that was my experience and my um, discovery as well, Jason, that, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. You took me through an emotional roller coaster. My forearms are, are my hairs are sticking up on my forearms and I'm sure anyone that's checking this out right now. So let me ask so we can, because obviously I have some key questions that are going to help the audiences in different ways throughout their journey in life. But what would you say is the root of what caused you and say this as briefly as you can, your depression um, and I, and I ask you this question very precisely, I have worked and I work with clients to this day, whether it's in their life, wellness, relationship, and social media branding, coaching, where they, they say a lot of the things that you just mentioned, which is, oh, okay. I thought once I would become athletically skilled, hot, sexy, I would be happy. I thought once I make tons of money, I would be happy. They're always chasing. So I always tell them, dude, that's not the good way, way to go about it, but I want them to hear it from you. Why is that? Why were you depressed? And what happened once you got the body, once you got the money, why were you still not happy? Yeah. So there are levels to this question, but the deepest level is that thinking was the problem. Just thinking. Uh, without thinking, you're already tapped into and didn't turn on. You're already peacefully alive. And that's what I call happiness. And so you can discover that because in the moments where you feel most alive and you're at your happiest, you're often thinking very little or nothing at all. Okay. So happiness equates to not thinking and unhappiness equates to thinking or overthinking to a large extent. That doesn't mean we want to get rid of our mind. It just means that we want to put it to better use. We don't want our mind to use us. We want to use our mind uh, for our own benefit. Uh, but lots of us are obsessed with thinking and overthinking and analyzing, overanalyzing, that's most of us. And so happiness, unhappiness for me was all about that. Okay. Now thinking leads to all kinds of other problems. And for me, it was perfectionism for one, that was a huge one. Um, second, I had these ballooning expectations. So I expected everything or, and everyone outside of me to make me happy. So I was looking for happiness in all the wrong places. You know, we look for love and happiness in all the wrong places and all places outside of you in the world are wrong places. We also look at for it in all the wrong times. So we look for peace and love and happiness either in the past or the future. Um, but peace, love and happiness don't exist in the past or future because the past is a memory and the future is just fantasy, right? Um, happiness only exists in the present moment and presence itself. So that's a couple of ways of saying the same thing, which is that we think our way out of happiness all the time. Wow. Wow. That's just crazy. I mean, the way you explain it, even though I completely agree with you, it's it's the thinking, right? So what ultimately, so you mean to tell me after you got in great shape and guys, if you're not following, I'm going to put all of Rob's information. This guy's in phenomenal shape. Obviously, he's very successful. Um, what what finally clicked, I guess, meaning you you have you say you got the six pack, right? Yeah. You do. And then you're like, uh, you're looking in the mirror or whatever. Are you mean you mean to tell me you were just overthinking negative thoughts and you were just basically not good enough? And then what happened? What was the the turning point of okay, I'm happy now? Oh, so so good, Jason. Such a great clarifying question. So for me, I get to that place where I, I was, you know, I did I was saluted to in my high school class. You know, I was um a standout cross-country player, pretty good basketball player. I eventually went on to work for a consulting company. I'm making good, good money, got two German cars, have a beautiful girlfriend, she speaks five languages, you know, the whole nine, right? And I was no happier than I was when I had none of that stuff. In fact, I was a lot less happy 
with all that stuff. So it was that. And I was like, there's this disconnect going on here. How can I be more successful mm-hmm. and even healthier and feel somewhat more attractive and yet be more depressed? So as I began researching ways to kill myself, I decided I was going to slash my wrist, got a kitchen knife. I dug into my wrist and still have the t- suicide test marks in my wrist to this day. But something very dramatic and unexpected happened in that moment, which is that for no good reason, without anything in my life changing, because remember, I had a pretty good life. I just didn't feel good as a result of it. Despite none of that changing, on the inside, I suddenly felt this inexplicable peace and love and joy that I had never experienced before. And it seemed to come out of nowhere. It came at the point when I was contemplating ending my life. And so... I postponed the suicide for a couple of minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And I thought, well, I'm going to do a different kind of research. I'm going to look up happiness and unhappiness and depression. What's it mean? What causes it? Blah, blah, blah. And I began a different path. It's taken me about 20 years to kind of come around to realizing that in that moment that I was contemplating my own, killing myself. Yeah. In that moment, I was for once in my life, I had experienced a quiet, cool, calm, composed, sort of still and silent mind. And that's why I felt the peace and the love and the happiness. And so that was the first indication to me that like, obviously chasing stuff, accomplishing things, acquiring things is great by all means, enjoy all of it. But it was no remedy for the depression I felt on the inside that was caused by me always thinking something could be better or was better or somebody else was better. You know, there was no, there's no sort of solution to that that I had to sort of cure that at its root cause, which was thinking itself. Wow, dude, I commend you. I commend you. Uh, 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 man, uh, I'm emotional in a good way, obviously. Woo! I, uh, I relate to you in different factors, and I'm sure a lot of people can right now. But you said something at the tail end, and you said it was me, right? And I want everybody that's really taking this episode and – you may want to rewind what Rob just said. It was him that was causing this, right? Yeah. It wasn't the girlfriend. <laughs> it wasn't the job because obviously he had a great girlfriend, you know, doing awesome. It was himself. And he quieted his his brain. He shut his brain off. So let's do this. This is a great segue, which I wasn't planning on this you know, question, how do you quiet your brain when you're having these thoughts for anyone that's, wow. you know, great question. So in the beginning for me, you know, I took the, I think I learned everything the hard way. <laughs> so really, I, didn't, right? Right? Yeah. Really. I didn't recognize in the beginning that it was a quiet mind. I just thought that I had this divine intervention happen, which is true too. But so in the beginning for me, it was just recognizing, well, first of all, it was prioritizing happiness over achievement. It was prioritizing happiness over success, number one, and saying that, look, the only reason I want to be successful is because I want to be happy. If I can be happy, I have everything that I think and hope success will provide, which is happiness. But then I read all this research that said, if you get happy, all the success you want comes your way automatically and effortlessly and easily and enjoyably, right? So so that was number one, man, like prioritizing happiness above all else. So that meant I had to prioritize how I felt. So then that meant I needed to recognize or become more aware of when I felt bad. And when I felt bad, I was a choice point. I could either continue investing in this sinking stock that was making me depressed. So whatever story I had going on in my head, whatever behavior I was up to, or I could pivot and go in a different direction and begin to focus on things that made me feel better. In the beginning, it was mostly activities. So I said, oh, I'm going to try to do more of the things that make me feel genuinely happy and less of the things that don't make me feel genuinely happy. I called them happiness islands. So I'll spend more time doing activities that are on my happiness items list. And I'll try to outsource, delegate, reduce, eliminate, automate, or regulate all the activities that are on my happiness deserts list, meaning things that don't energize me, don't inspire me, don't make me happy. But then over time, I realized it's not just what you do, it's also what you think. So then I began practicing telling better feeling stories based in truth about everything and everybody in my life. So it's like if I had no money, I'd say one way of saying it is that I'm broke. The other way of saying it, it's only up from here. Right. Or if it's raining, it's not a bad day. It's just I love sunshine so much. And the rainy days make the sunny days that much happier for me. But I began working on what I call cognitive reframing, which essentially is beginning to tell better feeling stories based in truth 
about everything in your life simply to feel better. Because when you feel better, you do better, and then life goes better. So that's where I started in the beginning. Eventually, I got to a place. This last thing is, eventually, got to a place where I didn't need to work so hard at telling better feeling stories based in truth. I could simply practice what's called a micro meditation. A micro meditation is just one breath you take from the stomach through the nose, where you pretend like it's the last breath you'll ever take again. So most of us forget we might have who knows a hundred years left, or we might have ten seconds of life left. But if you can pretend that you have only one breath left, and you make your goal to enjoy that one breath as deeply as possible, while you let all your thoughts go, and you do it throughout the day as frequently as you can, you become really good at it. And in about 22 to 66 days, you reprogram your brain to do it effortlessly or automatically. How many seconds? Uh, well, you do it for just one breath. But if you practice it for about 22 to 66 days, your brain rewires itself to do it more effortlessly. So however long it takes someone to breathe. So if it takes me three seconds, that's three. Anyone that's doing it. Okay, everybody, let's pause for five seconds. Here we go in five, six, seven, eight. And everybody inhale deep. I feel good. <laughs> I know that I should. You know what? I actually do feel a little better. And I tell you why. I just use what you just said. Yeah. It's the last breath I have. Yeah. Damn. It's you, you know, it's like that question when they say, if you only had 24 hours to live, where would you go? What would you do? <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. And that's the exactly the idea. You would you wherever you were, if you if you someone told you you only have five seconds to live, wherever you were were, you try to enjoy that five seconds as much as humanly as humanly possible. Yeah. Right. The way you can enjoy it is by breathing from the stomach that induces a relaxation response, letting your thoughts go, and just truly trying to enjoy being alive just yeah. for a couple seconds. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Let me ask you this. So a lot of people come to me, you know, when they're in and, you know, they're not in great shape, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, and same thing with you. We're very similar <clears throat> uh, in our in our practice. What do you tell people or what do you suggest people that have a very negative mindset and always give themselves excuses as to why they're basically a failure? And that they will never finish what they started or amount to anything. Mind you, this can be apl applicable, whether it's someone that's trying to lose weight. And trust me, I've dealt with a lot of that. People that are trying to take their career to this next level, but they are stuck in this mental space where they're just no, I, I've tried. I'm never going to make it. I'll be fat for the rest of my life. I'll be broke for the rest of my life. What, what, what do you come in as the mechanic, so to speak? Where, where do you come in? How do you, how, do you, how do you tune these people up? Yeah, I think the first place, of course, is just to meet people where they are. Um, there's extraordinary power in that, just people feeling that you understand, that you get it. You do that so well, Jason. That's something that I'm always wanting to do first and foremost. And then second, you know, I want to explore with them a little bit sort of why doing what they've always done continues to get them what they've always gotten, right? Um, it can be extraordinarily difficult to let go of patterns of behavior or ways of doing things because you've done them for so long. And so it's hard for people to hear from me, um, but I think, you know, we all want to change. And I remind people, look, if you can relax, if you can find a way to feel better, I promise you'll lose more weight. You'll make more money. You'll save more money. You'll make more friends. You'll date a lot more enjoyably and a lot more successfully. And so part of my job is to sort of meet people where they are and then help them see that what they've been doing isn't working to create the life they want. And then third, help them to see that there's a lazier, smarter way to enjoy and experience and achieve everything that they want in their lives. And that's where the sort of science of positive psychology comes in because it basically tells people, hey, if we can help you feel better, you'll do better and life will go better. Sure. I mean, what, what do you... What do you tell people? And 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 it's funny, I, God, and it's the truth. You know, as you know, I was really fat uh, for many years, and you know, I used to lie a lot. <laughs> I used to lie a lot to peers, trainers. Did you do this, Jason? Oh yeah, I was a great BSer, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and talk about karma coming one eighty on me. I've had so many people lie to me, you know, and it's kind of like 
you know, like me and my fat friends growing up, we would always joke around within each other and be like, fat people lie because <laughs> we, you know, we were good liars, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, what do you tell, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard whether again, whether it's losing weight, whether it's someone that say they're starting a startup business and say it's in the clothing field and you know, they have to create so many units, right. And they have to get their logo straight, their marketing, you know, and a lot of times when I work with these people, they'll tell me, yes, I did it. You know, and I hate to be like, Hey, can you turn it in your assignment? Yeah. Yeah. Like 90% of it is not, not there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's happened to you. What do you, how do you call someone out? Cause I am not a dick. Yeah. But there's times where I'm like, listen, don't waste your time, energy and money. And please do not waste my time. Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it defeats the purpose. If you're working with someone and they're going to BS you, you know, most of the ride. No, it's totally true. I mean, the one thing that I find is that um, you can lie to yourself. You could try to. It doesn't go very well. You can lie to other people for sure, um, but you can't lie to the universe. So it, it's true. Even though you know, lots of us um, might struggle with this whole law of attraction thing. There are actually real scientific, um, empirically driven uh, evidence to support um, you know law of attraction. So we know confirmation is real. Behavioral confirmation is real. We know um, that you know there are ways in which the universe reflects back to you what you truly think and say and do, right? And so um, I don't try too hard to call people out. I mean, the truth is I let people be what they're being and do what they do and say what they say. And then I find that for the most part, the universe reflects back to them whatever it is they need to do or change or be, right? So, um, it, you know, best case scenario, I'll say something like that to them, like, well, you know, if what you're doing is working, keep it up. If it's not working, let me know, give me a ring, right? Um, but I don't try um, too hard to persuade people of anything or influence uh, anybody to think anything. I've sometimes found that um, there's a saying, an expression I love, which is um, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. Um, I'm a firm believer that everybody comes to their own acknowledgements, recognitions on their own. Now, that being said, if I feel like I'm having an experience with somebody and we're not in alignment, I don't want to preach to them and I don't want to tell them to live their life differently. I just say, hey, I'm going to go in this direction and you go in that direction. I love to support you from a, from afar, from a distance, or I'll refer you out to someone else. Um, but I don't want to get into the whole conversation discussion and uh, in a way where I'm calling them out about things because I feel like it's not good karma for me. Sure. I mean, with what you said, I agree and I disagree. Sometimes people need to be called out, mm -hmm. right? Not, not mean, yeah. not yelling. Yeah. Uh, there's a different way to go about things. For example, you know, say trainers or coaches, I've had the mean coach and I've had the nice coach, right? Very two different types, but they both demanded the best out of me, my best efforts. As you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? How we, how we interpret that, that's a whole different, you know, episode, <laughs> yes, yes. right? But with me, I like to be called out. I mean, shoot, whether it's my mentors, my mom, my girlfriend, in the moment, I don't like it. Woo! I don't like <laughs> it. Oh! But I look back and I'm like, hey, is this person trying to make me better or bitter? Right? Better yeah. or bitter. Right? We only become bitter if we truly just don't want to change. Yeah. Right? And I've, I've, I've had at least more than a dozen clients. And I've been doing this for God knows over 10 years now, where a lot of times people, they want it, but they don't want to put in and do all the work. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, and I struggle with that a lot in the beginning of my work in business. And you're right about that. No question about that. In fact, I would often um, say to some clients would actually say to me, Rob, I think you want this more than me. And I would say, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. Right. And you're right. Sometimes um, I would say to them, if you, um, the key for me is being truthful to, to your point. I want, I'm going to speak my truth always, and I'm going to speak it in a way that's loving and hopefully they're able to receive it. I want to say it in a way that they'll receive it and enthusiastically apply it. So I'm always aiming and optimizing for that um, because I've done things before where I've, I've had a client or two that said, Rob, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth. I'm like, well, I've been telling you the truth the whole way. I can say it in a lot more aggressive, 
fashion or a lot more blunt way if you prefer, but I promise you don't want that. Then you say it and then, you know, no longer you have a relationship, professional relationship or anymore. And then sometimes they'll double down on their initial effort, which wasn't working in the first place. So it can go either direction. So anyway, I love what you're saying, which is like, yes, speaking the truth, but I believe in speaking the loving truth. Um, to, so to someone, for instance, that didn't have the desire or didn't seem to be expressing the desire, I would say, you know, let's explore this a little bit. Like there are some things in my life that I'm only interested in or only curious about. And then there are some things that I'm willing to die for. Is this experience for you feel like more like more like something that you're interested in and maybe curious about or something that you're like willing to die or, or live for like where's your commitment level so for me it's a question absolutely i think the biggest hurdle as a whole connecting it to this and and any anyone that's watching or listening whether you know um they're at whatever they consider 75 75 fulfilled in their life 90 percent or 20 percent a lot of it comes down to accountability within themselves and us as coaches, right? Yeah. Meaning we can only be so good of cheerleaders and mentors, right? A lot of it comes down to them actually applying everything. One of the biggest hurdles is truly people being consistent and finishing what they start, right? right. And it breaks my heart. There's people that, you know, it, that I've worked with that are now very successful, but they worked for three, four years with me. I mean, they they lost the over 100 pounds. Their business is thriving, their relationship. And I'm like, hey, guess what? We went from doing four sessions a week. Now we're only doing two. Now we're only doing one a month. And as soon as like the accountability is not there, booyaka. Yeah, yeah. But you, you can't, you're right. You can't manufacture and you can't manufacture that. You can't, I mean, you could try as a coach, you can try to hold people accountable for things or as a partner, or as a friend, you could try. Um, and I tried real hard in some cases for a very long time. And then I got to a place in my life where I, where I said, listen, as long as you continue showing up, I'll continue showing up for you. But when you stop showing up, I'll stop showing up. It's just that simple. It's that easy. It's that clean. Um, and I've discovered that um, you can't want it for anyone else, Jason. That's what you're saying. You can't want it for, you have to want it for yourself. And until you're at a place where you're wanting it for yourself and you're wanting it deeply and fully and truly, nobody can do it for you. You know, you can't do anyone else's push-ups for them. I can't do push-ups for, you know, for anyone else either. Um, and I've let, so I've let that part go. I've let go of this idea that I'm responsible for what anyone else achieves in the world. Yep. I, I think basically, because I agree with everything you just said, the biggest thing, so we can move on to the last question, is... A lot of people's excuses are way higher than their goals, right? In other words, it's very easy for someone that's working with a coach to say, uh, yeah, I can't afford it anymore. Uh, I don't have time. I'm, you know, it's, I'm so tired after work. I got the kids. They can give you a pile of excuses. Now, if you and I were genies, right, and we could really figure out the truth, I can tell you firsthand. I've had people tell me that they come back six months, a year later. And they've been straight up with me. They're like, look, I lied to you. Uh, actually, I could afford it. I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to be accountable anymore. Right. I didn't want to eat the six meals a day like you told me to. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. That's it. I respect that, you know, but I just, you know, I always send positive vibes to the universe that whatever you do, anyone that's watching or listening, whatever you do, if you're going to do it. Do it because you really want it. Don't do it for anybody or anyone. Like Rob said, he was doing things and he got them. But he wasn't happy. Right? Comparing himself. You nailed it. That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly what you just nailed it. And, and I think we all have a lot of judgment, self-judgment around the things that we genuinely want versus the things we think we should want. Right? And that was part of the chat. Like what you're saying here is, is so accurate. I mean, I was so miserable because I was chasing things that I didn't even often truly want for me. I wanted them for other people in order to show other people that I was important or valuable or yes. significant or moral or ethical or whatever. And um, there's a lot of unhappiness in that. Yes. Okay. Last question. This is my favorite one. And God, we're definitely going to do a part two next year. Um, so right now I'm holding a little stick. Let's just imagine this is the body of somebody right now. What do you what do you tell people psychologically that are constantly 
comparing the new modern society plastic surgery specialists Let's talk about you know getting lip injections getting hair uh injections breast implants bbls everybody's got want want that tiny little waist i mean the six pack the fake calves we're talking for both men and women yeah. what is your take on this because for me again we are going based on what society is considering hot right now remember yeah. a few years ago a woman that was curvy was not considered hot now it's a trend right trends always change but us as individuals if we stay true to ourselves we're always going to be caliente so yeah. what what do you tell people that are men and, and women that are so like i have to get the bbl i have to get the special surgery so i can look like xyz that are comparing themselves and want to fit into society standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would say, first and foremost, um, explore your true motivation for doing it. You know, if it's a, like to your point, if it's about meeting other people's expectations or other people's ideas or concepts of what beauty is, um, you know, explore that. Just explore it. Um, I would also say that, you know, um, do what you genuinely want to do. If you want to do it, do it. And at the same time, remember, ultimately, that the true self is formless. So work on the form if you want and do whatever you want to the form. Uh, ideally, do it from an informative place, but do whatever you want to the But at the same time, make sure that you're doing the inner work, which is diving more deeply into what and who your true self is. And that true self is formless. So in other words, um, we're not um, human beings have a spiritual experience every now and then. We're spiritual beings having, ex having a human experience, right? We are spirit ultimately, we're non-physical energy, ultimately, we are awareness or consciousness, ultimately. And so I'd say that the more in touch you get with the thoughtless, wordless, faceless, formless essence that you truly are, the more you see the beauty and value of that, the less you're motivated to always be improving, tweaking, nipping, tucking everything on your body. And that doesn't mean you won't do a few of those things. For sure, you might do a lot of them. But you'll find that you feel less and less obligated or compelled to sort of prune the leaves on the tree as opposed to just digging deep into the roots and really discovering the peace and the love and the self-love and the joy that's there so um that's what i would say so no judgment um on you know with respect to anyone if it makes you happy go for it um just make sure that it's um authentic happiness i like that authentic happiness i tell people ask yourself if kind of like how me and you can pick up a magazine or read into history, looking back at it would, you know, I always make fun of it. Like, I feel like if I ever had kids, they're going to be like, hey, dad, so you mean to tell me back in early 2000s, mid 2000s, people used to look like ducks, ducks on purpose? Yeah. Yes, yeah, son. Uh huh. Uh, so you mean to w tell me that women would be OK, not working out their legs. They would have skinny, dippy legs and then they would have these humongous big butts. Right. That was a trend. So they actually put things that are not part of their body on their body. They paid somebody. Yes, son. I always tell people, look into the future, not to give yourself anxiety, but just to be realistic as to how you want things to look or be. Right. Or same thing. You and I have talked in the past. When we want to when people ask questions to us about like you know they're having troubles ask yourself the same question right what if my friend wanted to get bread breast augmentation would i want that as well if i was a female and weigh out the pros and the cons right there's always pros and cons but ask yourself once you had it just live your live in that moment you have all the surgeries you wanted i ask yourself then are you truly happy is that what's going to cause you happiness, right? Yeah, love that. It's great. You're you're right. It's a great exercise to think about your future self, you know, and uh, imagining, visualiz visualizing and trying to feel into what that experience would be like. And you're part of the point you're making too, which is that, you know, look at all of the things that you've prayed for or yep. said and did for, demonstrated or manifest in your life and notice how, for the most part, you're not that much, if any, happier as a result of it. You know, even the best things you've accomplished, acquired, or achieved, 
Um, so it's, yeah, it's a really great point you make. Um, this future self exercise is great. Heck yes. Well, Rob, I can't thank you enough for taking your time today uh, and sharing all of your power, love, energy, and knowledge to, to not only myself, but everyone out there. Um, I want everybody to go follow Rob right now, not tomorrow, not later, at Rob Mac Official, and that's on all platforms, Platforms, correct? That's okay. right. Um, if you guys have any questions, please drop them in the comments. Why? Because when we do a part two, me and Rob can break it down and shake it down. Woo! Yes. Dude, thank you for being you. Thank you for being real. I love you, my brother, for real. That feeling is so mutual, Jason. I so appreciate and love you, man. Seriously. Just not only as a professional, obviously a professional and a host, but also as a friend and just a human being, man. So thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for being my friend. Thanks for uh, being in conversation with me. Absolutely, bro. Have the best day ever. We'll see you soon. Keep it caliente. Make sure to subscribe to my channel if you're a new viewer. And don't forget to click on the bell so you can get notifications every time a new show releases. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and feel free to leave your comments. I'm Jason Roselle and you're watching Get Inspired with Jason.